calls and sends women and men to share in Christ's ministry. In the early church in Antioch, the Holy Spirit instructed the community to set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In the early stages of such ministerial service, ordained leaders walk with commissioned leaders to mentor and form them in Christ's ministry, just as Ananias, the more seasoned leader, guided Paul, the newly called evangelist, toward the fullness of his calling. We gather here to commission men and women for ministry in the church. We will also recognize one who has been elected as an associate member of this annual conference. John, or not the gospel, the letter of John, 1 John 4, starting at verse 7. Dear friends, we should love each other because love comes from God. Everyone who loves has become God's child and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that he could have, we could have life through him. This is what real love is. It is not our love for God. It is God's love for us in sending his son to be the way to take away our sins. Dear friends, if God loved us that much, we should also love each other. No one has seen God. But if we love each other, God lives in us and his love is made perfect in us. We know that we live in God and he lives in us because he gave us his spirit. We have seen and can testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God has God living inside and that person lives in God. And so we know the love that God has for us and we trust that love. God is love. Those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. This is how love is made perfect in us, that we can be without fear on the day God judges us. Because in this world, we are like him. Where God's love is, there is no fear, because God's perfect love drives out all fear. It is punishment that makes a person fear, for love is not made perfect in the person who fears. We love God because God loved us first. You have heard the scriptures that reveal the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Our preacher for this evening is Sherry Graber, who is a lay member and lay leader from the Algoma Boulevard United Methodist Church in Oshkosh. Sherry is a licensed clinical social worker, substance abuse counselor, and independent clinical supervisor working in the addictions field. She's been the recipient of the Wisconsin Association on Alcohol and Drug Abuse Outstanding Professional Award in 2004 and the Dr. Juliet Martin Thomas Award for Commitment and Excellence in the Field of Human Service in 2005. She's married to Richard Graber, and together they enjoy their two wonderful grandchildren. Sherry has served in the past in the conference as conference lay leader, past Winnebago District lay leader, general and jurisdictional conference delegate, and past co-chair of the Commission on the Status and Role of Women. Currently, she's a certified lay speaker and member of the Board of Ordained Ministry. We thank you, Sherry, for agreeing to bring the word tonight, and we welcome you and wait to hear what God has given.
Bishop, members of the cabinet, all of you that are about to be commissioned and recognized and who will enter among us in ministry to help guide us and lead us and to be partners in this great venture. Guess all, all of you are loved by God and all of you and all of you are called to love. God's most precious gift to us is love. Love is what draws humanity and God together. God first loved us unconditionally. God keeps trying to draw us back into that relationship. Jesus commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. It is Jesus' lived example that we hold up in order to know how to love. Love is a verb. It's not conveyed just in words, but it is conveyed in actions. Love is not passive. Love is not quiet. Love does not hide. Love makes us who we are and calls us to give love away. Andrew Murray, in his sermon, Rich in Good Works, describes this kind of love in three interwoven facets. First, God's love for us. Second, our love for God. And third, our love for each other. These cannot be separated. God's love for us, our love for God, our love for each other. These are woven together inextricably not to be separated. We then are called to love our fellow men and women just as God loved us and just as we love God. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorite authors, gives us some very practical advice. He says, don't waste time bothering about whether you love someone. Just act as if you love them, behaving in that way, and you will come to love them. John Oxenham, who is also one of my favorite authors, in his work No Holds Barred, describes characteristics of the love about which I speak this evening. He says that love gives forgives and outlives everything. Love gives, forgives, and outlives. He says that this is love's prerogative, to give and to give and to give, and when there seems to be nothing left, love still has a measure to give. When we're filled with this kind of love that comes from God, there's no room for spite or judgment or prejudice. We too can love unconditionally, not considering whether that love is earned or deserved, because certainly we didn't earn it or deserve it, but just sharing God's love with everyone around us. We do not ever have to worry about having enough because God will always supply what we need. There is no shortage of love. If there is a shortage, it is a shortage of our ability and willingness to share it. We're eager to share this love because of what it means to us. It gives us hope. It is our reason for joy. 
It gives us comfort and peace. And through it, we find forgiveness and grace. Because we have been so richly blessed, we seek to share those blessings with others. Everyone, no exception, everyone is worthy of love. And everyone is our neighbor. If you look up on the stage this evening and you look around at the people sitting in the chairs and the people running the technical equipment and our wonderful musicians, you have a perfect example of your neighbors. All our neighbors to one another. You see, that's the nature of Christian love. Christian love is unconditionally given based on need. Lord knows we all need it. Not based on deserving it or earning it. It's given regardless of the response of the recipient. You see, you don't have to give me something back in order for me to love you. You don't even have to acknowledge it. You don't have to say thank you. It is the giving that makes us who we are. It's freely given without any expectation of gain or even acknowledgement. That is the nature of the Christian love we are called to. Such love is a rational decision. It's made after a lot of prayer and thought. It is the core of who we are in our being. It's not random. It's an act of will. Each day, we have the opportunity to get up and to decide how our day will go. Now, that doesn't mean we have control over the external things about us, but it does mean that we have the decision to make about how we will live out the love that we've been given. Now, if you're like me, on some days you get out of bed a little bit less than optimistic. Occasionally, I will have to set the alarm, despite the fact that I'm an early morning person, and when that alarm goes off and I've set it to buzzer instead of music, sometimes the alarm clock sort of comes off the end table next to my bed as I'm trying to figure out how to shut it off. Those are the challenging days. And for me, that's when I turn on my Christian radio. I listen to Casting Crowns and Jeremy Camp and Third Day. And recently, I listened again to a Third Day CD and the title of the piece that I like so much is Move. Now certainly if you were listening to the music, as we came in and the songs that we sang, it invited us to move, didn't it? And that is who we are, a moving, living, breathing people. Well, in this song, it is a non-believer reaching out to believers and saying, I can see that you've got love. I can tell you that I've got time. Why don't you make a move before I change my mind? I'll give you all the time you need before I walk away. Why don't you make a decision now before I change my mind? And here's the clincher. The lyrics go, I'm here to know what you're believing and to know who you are. So you see, love is a verb. It's not just words. We can say things, we can write things, we can print things, we can have banners, we can have slogans, we can do all of that. But if we don't live it out, it's pretty empty. 
John Westerhoff, an author and theologian, expands for us on loving one's neighbor, and he says that the self-denying love that we Christians practice is unknowable apart from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And he goes on to say that sacrificial love is that which can lay down one's life and become willing to reconsider and maybe lay down one's ideas over and against discerning God's will for our present time. See, scripture is alive and filled with love and it speaks to us every day. So whenever we think we know what it says, read it again. God's word is alive in us today. So then again, I say our love must be active. It cannot be passive. It cannot just be words. It must be lived out in the steps that we take. It needs to show concern for the emotional, the intellectual, the physical, and the spiritual well-being of all our neighbors. And so let's beg the question, who's our neighbor? Just who is our neighbor? Who among us do we struggle to call neighbor? Is it those whose ideologies and theologies are different from ours? Is it those among us who behave in ways we don't want to understand and sometimes refuse to listen to? Is it those who tell us we're irrelevant? Is it those who say, where is this God you talk about with all the evil and tragedy in the world right here with us? Is it alcoholics and drug addicts? I will tell you that if you want to experience some unbridled, pure spirituality, visit a recovery group sometime. It is truth spoken in love. It is honesty. It is acceptance. The church these days is often not the first place people turn when they're in turmoil. Yet we know that the knowledge of God's love expressed through the way we live our lives and how we reach out to others has that life-changing, love-giving grace. Sometimes we keep it to ourselves. You see, it's in reaching out to others that we are changed. It's in seeing Jesus in every other that there is. After all, that is who Jesus is, is he not? Did he not come to be the face of every other? When we do that, we receive unconditional love and we, we can give it back. Love is a life-changing experience. I was privileged this March to attend the National Hispanic Plan Conference in Texas. We were on a beautiful campus with marvelous sunshine, roses in bloom, a sunroom with windows coming in. We hardly knew that we were in the big city area of Dallas-Fort Worth. If you remember, I think it was snowing and sleeting back here. I witnessed the kind of love and acceptance that Jesus offers us. 
as we worked together, as we lived together, as we spoke together, as we were gracious to one another. I was accepted, received, and blessed. And I want to tell you just a, a story of one young pastor that I met who for me embodied the ideal of Christian love in the situation in which she found herself. You see, she has a son who's an attorney, and she's always been involved in justice ministry. And so what she said was she had a vision, and her vision would involve work that would cross two conferences, and so she had to speak to several bishops. Here's what her vision was and what she's living out today. She is living in homeless shelters on the border between Mexico, Texas, some <laughs> other bordering states as well. And she is going from shelter to shelter, helping immigrants and would-be immigrants who find themselves in these homeless shelters to navigate the systems of two countries. She has experienced what it is like to be an alien in a country in which she was raised. She was witnessing and was arrested along with some other Hispanic folk who didn't have ID on them and spent time in jail. She placed herself in jeopardy and she continued to minister. And you know what? She ministered to the jailers. She ministered to the judges. She ministered to the attorneys. She has earned their respect because she saw them all as neighbors, all as worthy of love, all worthy of compassion. And so she lives this ministry, going from homeless shelter to homeless shelter, being present with people, serving the way she believes she's called to serve. And what a blessing it was to see her excitement, to hear her enthusiasm, and for us to bless her on her way. You see, God's vision is that if we see the world as neighbors, then justice for one is justice for all. Love for one is love for all. The love of God is always the love of God in its fullness and in its entirety. Love draws humanity and God together. We are called as partners today, clergy, and I know there are some out in the audience as well. And lady, we are called as partners today in this mission and ministry of love to the world. We have been equipped differently, but we have been called the same. To be the voice, the vision, and the face of love in this world. And we are in desperate need of each other to do this. It's time now for us to live out that vision. So I'd ask you, are you willing to make that commitment to listen actively and to love unconditionally? See, we've got love and we've got time. It's time to make our move and show the world who we are for the sake of Christ who came to redeem us all. Peace be with you.
enseñan en inglés. ¿Quién soy yo para que en mí tú pienses? Y que escuche mi amor. Es verdad lo que tú hoy me dices, que me amas. Soy yo para que mi tú pienses.
loving God, in the fullness of time, you sent us your best. You gave us Jesus, who dared to feed the hungry and welcome outcasts, who healed the sick and challenged the privileged, who announced that a new reign of love had begun. He promised to send the Spirit, told us we would not be alone, and continues to say, peace be with you. On the night he gathered his friends together, he took bread, the staff of life, the blessing of the Son, gave thanks, broke the bread, and gave it to them, saying, this is my body, broken and given for you. He took the cup, the fruit of the earth, the blessing of the rain. He gave a prayer of thanks and gave it to them. This is my life poured out for you, a sign of forgiveness and new covenant. As often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, remember me. So in remembrance, we offer our own lives in union with Christ. to us gathered here. Send your spirit to renew the earth, to reveal the paths of hope, to set us afire with joy. Strengthen your church to be witnesses to all the world. And may this meal be a sweet taste of that time to come when the Spirit will gather people from all the corners of the earth and all will sit in peace and harmony. together the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples and I invite you to pray in the language of your heart our Father Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. Because we all partake of one loaf, the bread which we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. 